and feasting everywhere. So there was this street, uh, a street survey. That means somebody actually went on the street and they start interviewing people. Okay. So well, there was this street survey, and the participants were told to name three things. Name three things associated with Christmas. All right. So the next slide. So top of the list would be Santa Claus, presents, snow. Now, is this what all Christmas is about? Have we missed our focus in the midst of all our festive shopping? So in other words, what should be our primary focus in this season from now and leading to Christmas? So for, for all of us here who have been attending the service for the last two weeks, you know that, oh, we are in the season of Advent. But seriously, do you know what is Advent all about? Or are you into the secular world with everybody else shopping and feasting and enjoying the holiday? So like I said, I cut my hair because I want to have something different. Would you believe if I tell you now that it's actually just a week? But it's true, okay? It's my hair, right? <laughs> right, you see, sometimes we just wanted to join something, just wanted to do something different. And in a season of this advent, in Christ, during Christmas time, we just want to join the crowd. We want to feast, we want to shop, and so often we forgot all. What is the reason for this season? So that's why today we want to learn from the prophet Zephaniah. The prophet, well, he was slightly uh, probably ministering in the 7th century BC during the reign of Josiah. This is one of, prophet uh, Zephaniah, okay, his book is, is one of the minor prophets. So, there, were only, there are only three chapters. And this morning, we are going to do all the three chapters. Are you with me? Thank you. Right, now this book of Zephaniah, the three chapters, it actually, because the, the whole passage, the whole message of this prophet, it really encompasses the three chapters. And it actually follows a, a very logical progression. So we shall go through that um, not to worry, very quickly, okay? We will do it very quickly. Can I have the next slide, please? So after all that God has done for them, the prophet Zephaniah, he begins with the judgment of Judah because they had worshipped idols, Baal, Molech, and, and other deities of the people around them. That was in Zephaniah chapter 1. Then, to the judgment of the nations for their wickedness, for the evil, that is in chapter 2. So the prophet Zephaniah, he referenced the nations from all points of the compass. So if you look at chapter 2, right, you can see that there are all the different places that he was talking about. And in chapter 3, he followed with the final judgment, where Zephaniah, he announced that Jerusalem stood under a death sentence. A death sentence! because his people no longer trusted and followed God. Because the city's officials, they were corrupted. They had perverted justice. Even the leaders, the prophets, the chiefs, the, the chief priests, who were to provide spiritual leadership, they were only concerned for their own selfish interests. And the people, the people were, would be destroyed because they had refused to accept the correction from the Lord. And the Lord would pour out his burning anger on all the people. That's why it is called the final judgment. And the earth would be consumed. But in the final section, which Reverend Ned read just now, chapter 3, verses 14 to 20, that is today's passage, Prophet Zephaniah he announced that the Lord's judgment would turn to salvation for the holy remnant from the nations and Israel. Yes, God who pronounced judgment. See, so much judgment, right? Judgment of Judah, judgment of the nations, the final judgment that he has on the people. God who pronounced all this judgment. Yet, he did not forget his people. He eventually would issue a period of hope to his people. 
So friends, what does it tell us? Very quickly, this book of Zephaniah is about judgment. It is also about hope. It is about the goodness of God, the love of God for His people. So today, today's scripture on Zephaniah 3, it is actually one of the commonly read and preached verse or passage during the season of Advent, especially during the, the week 3, which is joy. And so since we are in the season of Advent, right, today we shall deep dive into this particular passage, Zephaniah chapter 3, verses 14 to 20, and it is also known as the sum of joy, a sum of salvation. So as we progress, we shall establish how this song of joy that the prophet Zephaniah pronounced has its permanent relevance to Christians. Then, and now. Then, meaning the, niche, the remnants, and now. Who are we referring to then? We are referring to all of us here. The permanent relevance of this passage to all of us here today as well in 21st century. So we shall walk through the development in three areas. First, God addresses His people. Meaning, who? Who is the who is the audience? Secondly, God assures His people. So we want to know, what is God's assurance? And thirdly, God announces His plan of restoration. God announces His promise in that He is victorious and He loves His people. So in the third point, we want to look at what? Is the promise of God. So let's start with the, big, the first one. God addresses His people. With verse 14, where God addresses His people with commands to praise, to sing, to shout, and to rejoice. It says here, Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exhort with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. So what do we see here? Here, God calls His people to sing aloud, to shout, to rejoice, to exhort. But for what? To get that immediate attention, friends. Why does God need that immediate attention? You know, it is just like saying, you are the one that I want to talk to now. I am going to say something to you that involves you. So, listen up. And that is exactly what God is telling all of us here today. You notice that there are three names there. Zion, we have Israel, and we have Jerusalem. Now, God's people, they are geographically um, described in terms of Zion and Jerusalem. So, for instance, Zion is also known as the city of David. So, it is a designation of the whole entire city. And Jerusalem, it is a city set on hills. So being chosen by God as the location for his sanctuary, Jerusalem was his symbolic dwelling and became the only acceptable place for sacrificial worship. So the people, then what do the people call Israel? Yes, they are called Israel after their ancestor. So having said that, what is the significance here? What, why do we need to know all this? Now, to the hearer, the ones who hear this message, each of these names would recall a period of very significant activity on the part of God in their life. And to this group of redeemed people, the remnants of Israel, God issues a statement. God issues a statement that a day will come when the remnants' fears will give away to shouts of praises for God. So what do we have? The next slide. It says here, He has taken away the judgments against the people. Who has taken away? The Lord has taken away. In verse 15, against, He has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away their enemies. And He, have, he gave the assurance that Israel's Redeemer 
the Messiah King is in their midst. The Lord is in your midst and you shall never again fear evil. Well, this is something that I want to repeat. The Lord is in your midst. So God gave the assurance to Israel's remnants that Israel's Redeemer, the Messiah King, is in their midst. This is the long-promised deliverer. This long-promised deliverer will deliver them. Yes, God is the sovereign covenant God of Israel. He is the King who is there in their midst. And telling the random, the redeemed people to be glad and rejoice with all their heart. It really conveys a very important message. The message of assurance. That the past troubles are over and that the new era of redemption, redemption has begun. So friends, this is really a message of hope and restoration for the people. But what does it has to do with all of us here? We have not gone through such as what the Israelites have gone through. Is it still relevant to us when God does not seem to be addressing us in any way? We are not in Zion. We are not in Jerusalem. We are not in Israel. So, is this telling us anything? So, while the prophet Zephaniah, he anticipated that the future people of God will consist of a remnant, right, we mentioned, from the nations and Israel. All of us, all of us, we need to know that today in church, who do we see? We may have Jews, and we also have Gentiles. And we have you, and we have me. So during this Christmas season, Prophet Zephaniah, what his message is really doing is that he's calling out to each one of us, the people of God, to sing out aloud, to shout to rejoice and to exult and to share the good news that our Redeemer, our Saviour, our Messiah, Jesus is coming into the world. On top of all our shopping, all our feasting, all our buying of presents, do we remember our Messiah, Jesus, is coming into the world? Well, you may ask, who am I? Am I qualified to share the good news? Sometimes there's really this fear in us, right? Well, friends, God, He did not address the richest, nor the most powerful people in the land that their long-awaited Saviour was finally here. God chose to announce to the shepherds living in the fields that their Saviour has been born in the town of David. The next slide. Incidentally, today is the third Sunday of Advent. It means rejoice, gautete. It means rejoice, it emphasizes the joyous anticipation of the Lord's coming. Now, when we look at the shepherds, the shepherds, do you think they were terrified? Yes, they were. They were terrified when they saw the angels, especially when there were so many of them. But the angel told him, told them, do not be afraid. The angel reassured them, I have good news that will bring great joy to everyone. Friends, the angels announced that Jesus came for humble, unimportant people like the shepherds, like me. Is it like you? So is Christmas just a happy holiday for us? Followers of Christ, we call ourselves. No. We, the people of God, have nothing to fear because the Lord our King is in our midst and He has taken away all judgments and He protected us from all our enemies. We would celebrate and we rejoice that the Son of Man came to seek and to save the Lord, to save the lost. And we would sing like the angels sing, Glory to the newborn King. Now, Charles Wesley wrote this song, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. 
It says, Hark the herald angels sing, Glory to the newborn king, Peace on earth, And mercy mild, God and sinners reconcile. Therefore, all nations be joyful, Rise and join the triumph of the skies, While the, with the angelic host proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem. So friends, would we come together as our worship team lead us in this song? Would you read, meditate on the lyrics, such rich theology that we have in this song? And it means so much to all of us here this morning. Shall we sing this together? Hark the herald angels Shall we stand? sing Glory to the newborn King Peace on earth and mercy mild God and sinners reconcile Joyful all ye nations rise Join the triumph of the skies with angelic hosts proclaim Christ is born in Bethlehem Hark the herald angels sing Glory to the newborn King Christ by highest heaven adored Christ the everlasting Lord Made in time, behold him come, offspring of a virgin's womb. Veiled in flesh, the God and sea, hail the incarnate deity. Pleased as man with man to dwell, Jesus our Emmanuel. Visited friends. Now, this message of Zephaniah 3 is that God is always God of restoration of and hope. So God's people shall never, never again fear evil because all our troubles will come to an end. And that that um, message and that assurance it is really elaborated in verse 16. So on that day, it says here. The next slide. On that day, it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear not, O Zion, let not your hands grow weak. On that day, friends, let's look at this word. What does this on that day mean? It refers to the day when the judgment was complete and God's blessings completely manifest. And it says that, Fear not, O Zion, this do not fear. It's really a double confirm, you know, chop chop double confirm that this is a promise of salvation. So friends, the reason why the people can rejoice is that the Lord is in their midst. And verse 17 repeated this assurance. Verse 17, can we look at that? The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one, who will save? He will rejoice over you with gladness and he will, he will quiet you by his love. 
He will exalt over you with loud singing. Now friends, what catches your immediate attention in this verse? The Lord your God is in your midst. Indeed, you know, why we could rejoice? I'm repeating this. Why we could rejoice is because the Lord our God is in our midst. And here this is really God's promise that He will save. God being the warrior who brings salvation. So friends, just a short verse here. What do you see there? Do you sense God's love for His people here? You know, in this verse, God expresses His deepest inner joy, His satisfaction in His love for His people. It is just so amazing that God's love involves His giving of Himself. For what? To make us happy. So that we can in return give of ourselves and actually bring joy to God's heart. So there is really no reason for us to be fearful because God has accomplished His purpose. God brings joy to His people who rejoice in His presence, in His faithfulness. And here, God rejoices in the restoration of His people, His creation, a renewal of the covenantal relationship with God. So verse 17, let me read this again. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will exalt, he will quiet you by his love. And he will exalt over you with loud singing. This verse is in the Old Testament, but it's often called the John 3.16 of the Old Testament. So what is John 3.16? Can all of you say that? Shall not perish, but have eternal life. How does this verse 17 be John 3.16 in the Old Testament? Because it talks about God's love for His people and God's power to save His people. A mighty one who will save. So yes, friends, God delights in those whom He has redeemed. So what does God do when we worship Him? When we have music, we tend to raise our hands, you know, just, it sometimes can be just so auto, right? We just raise our hands, we raise our hands, we worship God, we sing praises to Him. But when there's no music, how do you worship God? See, God takes special delight in all of us when we worship Him, when we glorify Him. And this truth is also echoed in, by prophet Isaiah when he says in Isaiah 62. Let me read this. We don't have that slide. You shall be the crown of beauty in the, land of, in the hand of the Lord and the royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no more be termed forsaken and your land shall no more be termed desolate. But you shall be called my delight is in her and your land married. For the Lord delights in you, and your, your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you. And as a bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. Friends, this truth should bring great encouragement to all of us. For as we love God, as we glorify God, as we praise God, Scripture tells us that we are bringing joy. Scripture tells us that we are bringing delight to God's heart. That God rejoices in us. Now friends, isn't that our deepest joy of love when we bring delight to the heart of the one that we love? So what is the assurance of God? 
God is restoring relationship. God is re reconciling you to Him. He is filling our hearts with joy. He is filling our hearts with joy indeed. Yet, you know, so often, we are so inward-looking. We allow temptations, allow distractions to drift us away from God. But Prophet Zephaniah, he reminds us today that God is faithful. And in his epistle to, to the Romans, Apostle Paul, Apostle Paul also reminds us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God shows us his love for us that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. Friends, the ultimate assurance of the redeemed, it lies in God's quiet rejoicing because His plans will work out. God knows the beginning from the end. Today, the third Sunday of Advent. But what does Advent mean to you? Can we have the next slide? You know, in the midst of our busyness, the season of Advent, a tradition, it reminds us that we are living between the fulfilled promise of Christ's first coming and the yet-to-be-fulfilled promise of His second coming. Therefore, friends, we are to put aside our desires, our wants, but we are to turn our attention, our hope, our lives to Christ because He will come again. So whenever you come forward for Holy Communion, come, come and celebrate what Christ has done for you. Come and express your anticipation of His second coming. Now, friends, what a blessed assurance that you and I enjoy, right? What a blessed assurance because Jesus is mine. What a foretaste of glory divine that each and every one of us is given the opportunity. The heir of salvation, the purchase of God, born of His Spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story. Would you praise God? Would you praise Jesus? Would you praise our Saviour all the day long in your life for this blessed assurance that he has given you? Blessed assurance Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God.
watching and waiting, looking above, filled with His goodness. Friends, would you lost be lost in His love? This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Thank you for this blessed assurance that each you have given to each one of us. Touch our hearts, Lord. Stir us that we will praise you all the days of our life, Lord. Please be seated. Friends, is your heart being stirred? Are you touched by this love of God? And you know, it is, God loves us so much that just these few verses, it's just not enough. And God now, from verses 18 to 20, He came and He spoke in first person to His people. And this prophecy contains even more blessings, more promises from God. Can we have the next slide? God announces more blessings from verses 18 to 20. So the prophet Zephaniah, he pictures a day when all the sorrows associated with the people's sin and judgment would be removed. Well, that is a relief, isn't it? So imagine a relief from suppression, oppression, even suppression, yes, separation, suffering. What is even more amazing than knowing that all will be under the control of God 
as God is in control. And God made a promise that the lame, the outcast, will be brought back home to live in peace and security. Now we wonder, why did God make such an announcement? Perhaps, this problem declares that the exiles will return to their home. Well, if it will not be an, well, it will not be an issue, you know, if it is not an issue for the lame, for the outcast or the vulnerable, then all, all of us today will also receive that assurance, that promise. Basically, there's no stopping God to deliver and free His people from bondages. God is the deliverer. And God promised to restore the fortunes of the people of Israel. Now, this restoration, God says that it, will, it, will, it would occur before your very eyes. That is, in your own day. Now, friends, the blessings are, are so sure and the promises can and will be fulfilled because God himself he is a covenant-keeping God. He would deliver them. So from Prophet Zephaniah, we learn that God, He cannot tolerate worship of other gods beside Him or even alongside Him. He cannot tolerate violence, fraud, complacency, lying or deceit. In any case, Prophet Zephaniah, he speaks of a God whose passion to see justice done for the marginal, the poor, the oppressed, will not be set aside. All will be included in the promise of God. And God has absolute power to judge and to destroy because He created all things. He does not need to use any power in any arbitrary way. And God responds to evil and injustice or even idolatry, false worship. God responds to true and sincere repentance. God loves His people who serve Him humbly. And God proclaimed judgment against the abuses of the covenant people. But the prophet held out the possibility of repentance here. What is this possibility? The possibility if the people turned to righteousness. Basically, Zephaniah the prophet, he called the people to humble themselves before the Lord, that they might dwell before him. So friends, this morning, what is your response then to this message from prophet Zephaniah? As an individual, we are to be joyful witnesses and exercise persevering faith. And then in this community of faith here, as a member of the body of Christ, we are to be a blessing to the needy, to the brothers and sisters in Christ, in this body of Christ. Now, remember the street survey that I mentioned in the beginning of the sermon? Name the three things associated with Christmas. Can we take the next slide? Let us take a pause here. And if we ask ourselves now, what are the three things that you would associate with Christmas? What are the three things that you would associate with Christmas? It is not wrong to buy presents. It is not wrong to have feasting. It is a joy to share, right? It is a joy to give. But Zephaniah's message is very clear. In the midst of all, remember your God who is faithful. I remember there was one year, I, I wasn't here then, I like the title of what you have used in your CBE. I'm not sure if you remember or you recall. I remember because I just saw it. Be a person who is faithful and a people 
of faithfulness. Would you do that? God is faithful to all of us. Would you be the faithful servant of God in this season of Advent? As we go out, we can sing joy to the world because we know our Lord, our God, is in our midst. Joy to the world, friends. This is a song that we sing, right, so often during Christmas. But do you know really what the lyrics are telling you? So this morning, we shall sing joy to the world as a closing. With all of us remembering our mind, our soul, our heart, that the Lord, your God, is in your midst. In whatever that we do, let us be joyful, not only within ourselves, but be joyful to all in the world. Not for ourselves, but for the glory of God. Can we stand and maybe want to clap along as we sing Joy to the World? Let us sing Joy. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive the King. Let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. God, we thank you. We thank you for your promises, your assurance in our lives, Lord. So often, God, we look at ourselves. 
we solve our own problems using our own ways instead of turning to you. But God, we thank you that you have been so faithful. Would you turn our hearts, our attention to you? That as we go, as we go into the world, celebrating Christmas, we remember the reason for this season. That we bring joy to the world. And we would not hesitate going to the mountains. Go and tell it on the mountain. For the Lord our God is in our midst. We thank you, God. We thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Do you feel the joy of the Lord? How about the rest? Do you feel the joy of the Lord? Shall we give the Lord a round of applause? Amen to God. Now, friends, I really hope that all of us will bring with us the joy of the Lord everywhere we go. Because the joy of the Lord is our strength. Yes, that's right. Well, welcome everyone to the worship service of St. Carl Methodist Church. This morning, let me check whether we have any new friends with us. Yes, can I, can I welcome Joy Fu? Joy, hello Joy, welcome to St. Carl Methodist Church. And to all of us here, let's turn to our left, to our right and say hello to everybody. Hello. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Let us go into the world with joy. Right, at this moment, let us prepare our hearts to receive the Lord's invitation to His table. Can all of us please stand? Can we have the invitation, please? Are we ready? Thank you. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Together, merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with the whole, whole heart. We have feared to be an obedient church. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbours, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Forgive us, yes. through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pause a moment as you go to Lord in prayer. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, and that proved God's love towards us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Now let us offer one another signs of reconciliation and love. Shake, waving your hands. Please be seated. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for loving us so much, for giving us the joy, and the joy of the Lord is our strength. Lord, this morning as we present our love, our labour, Lord, use this for your kingdom, Lord. May this be pleasing, acceptable to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The offering boxes are right at the sides. If you have cash or any other offering, you may drop in, or you may do the e-offering.